record on this computer. Okay, welcome to the May uh, Sydney Lectures 2021. Uh, our speaker is Luke Capizzo. Actually, I was going to make sure I knew how to pronounce your name properly. I didn't ask. So hopefully, oh, that was perfect. All right, could have been better. And um, normally, I just let the person who's going to speak uh, tell us their story before they begin, if they want to, and then uh, I tell everybody, if you don't know who the people are who's speaking, you should go look them up because they're all important, influential people. I think Luke is the youngest person so far we've had speak to us, and we have a couple other people who hopefully will be attracted to the young scholars this year, later in the year. So um, with that, I'll let him tell us tell you who, about who he is and what he's going to do today. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, this is a short version. Uh, my name is Luke Capizzo. I'm an assistant professor at James Madison University in Virginia. Um, tonight I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. Uh, and I, I did my PhD at the University of Maryland, uh, finished up in 2019. So I've been at JMU for two years now. Before I went to Maryland and did my PhD, I was a practitioner uh, for, of PR for about 10 years. Um, I did both uh, agency work as well as in-house work, media relations, social media, internal communication, advocacy communication. Um, so I really, you know, in, enjoyed getting to know and building those skills from practice. And I think that um, for all of us who have done things on both sides, it really helps to inform what we do as researchers um, as well. And is a great way to, to kind of generate the kinds of topics that might be of interest, um, not just within this world of building theory, but also beyond uh, to the practitioner community. Once I got to Maryland, um, one of the things that I, I went there to study was the, the role of public relations as part of civil society. Like what, what are the useful ways that public relations can contribute to um, you know, making organizations better, making communities stronger, uh, making societies more equitable, all of those things. And so I was certainly attracted uh, very early on to theories of dialogue um, and read a lot of this work in, uh, as a graduate student and was really um, as infatuated by it as we'll, we'll see later as many other people have been over the years. Um, I think once I got into a little bit, it, a little bit deeper, um, I, you know, I was able to see that it was an area that while there's been a lot of development, there's also room for growth uh, and room for taking it in some new directions to be able to expand what we've done and build on it. So um, like many areas of PR, scholarship, there's there's room to run, which is exciting. And so uh, I was really thrilled to have this opportunity to, to talk more about dialogue and what I've learned um, in a few years of studying and publishing on it, but certainly with a lot of other areas that I'd like to dive into, uh, maybe with the help of some of you. So again, I'm thrilled to have everyone here, particularly my my colleagues from JMU who are here supporting, as well as some obviously, you know, leading scholars on dialogue who are all more than welcome to, to join in and add to the conversation. Um, excellent. So with that, we'll dive right in. I wanted to start with this little metaphor, right? A PR practitioner walks into a therapist's office. Uh, one of the, the most well-known, uh, beyond PR scholarship, most well-known understandings of dialogue in a formal way um, was put together by Carl Rogers, who was a leading 20th century American psychologist uh, and someone who was a significant proponent of what we now refer to as a client-centered approach to therapy. And his, his understanding of dialogue really elevated it. Um, uh, he's certainly not the, not the first or the only person to do this, but he was among folks who have elevated this concept of dialogue to be something that is more than just conversation. Um, so in his conception, genuine dialogue, um, you know, again, in this context of, of a person with power, that therapist working with the person in need, the client, the therapist should always actively aim to reduce that power differential. They should aim to let go of control and power. They should embrace as necessary risk, embrace maybe even fear in some of those moments and aim for creating meaning together, not trying to impose their will or their perspective. And so for him, those were some of the key elements of creating this conception of dialogue that would be useful in one-on-one -on -one interactions between a therapist and a patient. And that's in many ways the same thread 
that has led us to, to the, the grounding and dialogue that we've seen in public relations scholarship. Um, and Rogers is a name that has come up um, in multiple stages and by multiple folks, both in PR and more broadly in communication, who have talked about dialogue in, in ways where we're trying to build it into a more elevated, useful term. Um, two important components as we dive into that term. First, that dialogue is normative, right? It's something that we should aim for. It's something that we can aspire to, but we're never always going to get there. And it's okay that we're not going to get there every time. Um, another important part of this is that it's bounded. Um, it should not, it does not happen <laughs> randomly and it's not going to happen all the time. It's only going to happen under these specific circumstances. Um, and so with that, I, I, I wanted to you know, introduce a few of these core pieces to the models of dialogue that, that we utilize, but I think this is a good place to begin. But we have some problems. Um, starting with, and I, I always love this quote from Stoker and Tosinski, right, that PR practitioners and PR scholars have become infatuated with dialogue. They've used it over and over and over again. And sometimes that has been really productive for us. And sometimes that has been in ways that are counterproductive. Um, we've also seen the evolution of, and again, whether you've thought about it using this term or not, I'm sure you've seen this phenomenon of dialogue in name only. Dialogue being used for maybe not the best ends, right? So this could be the case of scholars who are studying social media and interactivity and calling it dialogue, even though it's just sort of mere interaction. Um, maybe it happens when we see practitioners, when we see organizational leaders say that they are having conversations or having dialogues with stakeholders and communities without any kind of aspiration or genuine engagement. Um, or maybe it's when we see, as uh, Anne has written about, mandated dialogue, right, where governments are telling organizations that they have to have these dialogic interactions with stakeholders. We can't force people to be genuine in these circumstances, right? So if we're utilizing that pure definition of dialogue, mandating doesn't really make sense. So again, we have an aspiration on the one hand, but we also have these challenges um, to, to really enacting that fully as practitioners and as scholars of dialogue. So within this, there are a couple of what I call related dangers, okay? Dialogue can become co-opted by those who are misusing it, right? And so we lose that, the value to the term. Dialogue can revert to being what's known as a primitive term, um, meaning that it, it loses any kind of special connotation. It almost just becomes equivalent to, to conversation. We don't have that value that's, that comes along with it, right? So it loses that normative value. Um, and we also see this danger of conflating dialogue with two-way symmetry, right? Uh, the symmetrical model, two-way symmetrical model from Grunig's work um, is a very different understanding of how public relations should engage with publics and stakeholders than a dialogic framework, even though they have some similarities. And so when scholars conflate those, again, we lose that added normative value. So we have a lot of challenges to, to building this theory in ways that are going to be both generative and useful for scholars, as well as hopefully resonate with practitioners, are useful for practitioners and are actionable for practitioners. So where do we go from here? And this is what, what we wanna to do today. Um, I wanted to lay out kind of my perspective of the two main challenges or opportunities for us um, as people who care about this kind of scholarship um, and are interested in seeing it grow. From my perspective, I think it's, it will be helpful for us to have some widely understood, widely used definitions for PR scholarship, teaching, and practice, right? So the more that we can continue to build, grow, strengthen, and expand the use of the definitions that we, we create, the better. Um, and then I think there's value in trying to expand the scope of what we can do with dialogue, as long as we're doing that without diluting its meaning and its value. So to me, those are kind of the, the ends um, that I see. I, I'm, I, there may be others that uh, others in the conversation can add, but those seem like reasonable places to start. And I wanted to, to sort of help everyone along that path um, today by doing two things. First, providing an overview of dialogue in PR scholarship. So, so where, where have we come from and where are we headed down 
uh, what I see is the sort of major trajectory of this work um, from uh, you know about 1989 until today. Um, and then the, the next piece would be to look at what's happened over the last few years, uh, as well as looking backward at some other scholars and, and thinkers more broadly, who might be able to provide us with some even additional new directions for theory building around dialogue. And I'll just say again, you know, please don't hesitate um, to add your questions, to add to uh, you know, the, the theories and descriptions of a lot of the different articles that I'm gonna to do today, especially if you may have written one of them. Uh, and again, it, it, please, please don't hesitate to interrupt. There are a couple of places where I'll pause um, and ask for questions, but make sure that you're ready to jump in. And again, don't hesitate to interrupt me if there's something that you think would be valuable to share. So here goes, dialogue in public relations. This is the quick roadmap, um, and then I'll give a little bit more detail on, uh, on each of these articles. Um, and, and I'll spend the most time on the ones that were part of the, the quote unquote reading list for today. Um, while Martin Buber was obviously not a public relations scholar, he's a, a theologian really and philosopher, um, his work is probably the single greatest philosophical influence on the majority of what we define as dialogue in public relations scholarship today. Uh, Ron Pearson uh, wrote, I think, the, the early pieces that clarified our understanding of dialogue as ethical, two-way communication. Um, so he's a, a really important figure, and it was wonderful to reread his work for me for the first time in a couple of years. So really, really uh, valuable perspective. Then obviously, as I, I would assume everyone on this call is aware, um, the important work of uh, Michael Kent and Maureen Taylor. Uh, looking at both dialogue and then dialogic engagement later on that did uh, for the first time a full integration of Buber embraced a digital mindset and tied this to engagement while really outlining the key features and principles um, that are a part of what we consider genuine dialogue um, for a lot of PR scholarship today. And then looking at some of the, the later pieces, which I'll, I'll touch on in the second half, among others, uh, Petra Tennyson's uh, work in terms of just a, a critical approach. What are the challenges that we are seeing in dialogue at this point? Um, and understanding, again, reinforcing that it's not this two-way symmetrical communication. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Anne Lane's work, the dialogic ladder, looking at mandated dialogue, and then uh, most recent piece uh, that she and Michael put together about negative spaces. So lots of really interesting uh, pieces to this, this train. Um, I'll start with Martin Buber here. Uh, if you haven't read I and Thou and you're interested in writing about dialogue, it's a really short book and it's really fascinating. So I would highly recommend that you take, take a couple of hours, uh, get it from the library. Um, and I think it'll, it'll really change your perspective on and, and situate this work from a, a useful philosophical place. He starts by saying that, you know, we, we exist because we encounter others, right? Because of our encounters with other people. And the, in essence, we can treat those encounters in one of two ways. We can interact with other people using a kind of genuine mutuality, understanding them as equal human beings, um, or we can see them as objects or means to an end. And he talks about the first um, in German as ich du, uh, and this, which would translate as I thou, again, to, to the title I am thou. And the second is ich est, or I it, right? Treating people as objects. And so the whole book can, can be seen through that lens. Um, and again, I know this is sort of the Wikipedia length version, but um, he's really able to, to look at the, the added meaning that comes out of the I-thou interaction, the challenges that come from an I-thou interaction and what we can learn from those. And so from his mindset, right, those are fleeting, they are potentially risky for us, but those are also where we are the most human. Um, and so again, I, I think this understanding of dialogue that ties it to our humanity and having to give something up um, is a really, really crucial place to start. Um, and in some ways, it, it's a difficult leap for us to make as folks who come from an organization-centric mindset, right, where we as PR people, we're always trying to keep the organization away from risk. We're always trying to, unfortunately, in some cases, impose on others rather, or advocate at least um, for the organization rather than think about others fully. And so 
I think that Boober is really powerful in reminding us that, again, as organizations are made up of human beings and interacting with human beings, we have to have this basic understanding of what dialogue is and can be. That said, I think there are some uh, things that we need to consider in terms of translating a one-to-one -one philosophy to an organization to organization or organization to individual context. All right. Next, Ron Pearson, Dialogue is Ethical PR Practice. This is his chapter from the first PR theory book in 1989. But he actually, there are there several Pearson 1989s that are about ethics and PR that are all, all interesting and useful. Um, but if anyone has trouble tracking this one down, I have a, a copy of it. So let me know if you need it. He starts off with bringing dialogue into PR, not necessarily Boober's dialogue, but dialogue more broadly. Um, and he does it in the context of organizations being socially responsible as well as socially responsive. So for him, under the right conditions, dialogue can be a helpful toward incorporating stakeholder values into what the organization's doing. So it's loosely sort of a, a, in, the, in a CSR context, right, where we're thinking about the responsibilities of the organization more broadly than just to uh, profit motive. And I like this quote to sort of summarize what he's after here. Decision making that is rooted in community resists objectivism. The values, norms, traditions, and standards embraced by a community are contingent in that they're conditioned socially and historically. On the other hand, extreme relativism is avoided because the community decisions are not subjective or arbitrary. So if we as PR folks are in an organization trying to understand what's going on in the outside world, the best way to do that is to go out and listen, right? To have conversations with folks who are outside of the organization to explain what we need, listen to what they need and try to find some ground in the middle. And that keeps us away from a couple of dangerous extremes. And so again, I, I, he, he sees um, this approach and largely bases it uh, in, in what I would think of as a Habermasian mindset. He, he cites Habermas as, as his main kind of philosophical source in a lot of places. This idea that dialogue can help us to sort of triangulate to a more ethical conclusion or place to, to end up um, as an organization trying to do the right thing. So that's my, my quick take on Pearson, Pearson's addition here. Um, in bringing dialogue as an elevated term to PR scholarship. Um, we saw, we've saw a couple of others in the 90s who built on this, including uh, Carl Botin uh, and, and others. But I, I think the, the main place where many of us start, uh, certainly as grad students when we're doing our citations on this, would be Kenton Taylor, 1998, which is the first article bringing it into the digital world. Um, I'll go through this quickly, but this, you know, I think importantly, says dialogue is a theory. <laughs> um, it builds on Pearson, but it also brings in Buber um, and introduces a couple of principles which I think are useful for us to think of uh, at, a, at an entry level in terms of what can help us push toward dialogue, right? The dialogic loop, the usefulness of the information that's provided, the desire to get people to come back to a website, ease of use and conservation of visitors. And again, Keeping in mind that uh, as their scholarship has continued to say over the years, technology certainly doesn't determine the ends, but it does matter, right? Um, and so then onward to the 2002 piece, which I, I, you know, I, I know is the, the more deeper theoretical contribution here. 2002 intro introduces us to uh, dialogue as an orientation um, and a mindset with a couple of key characteristics or facets um, that I think have been really useful for scholars and generative for scholars studying this over the years. Uh, mutuality, propinquity, empathy, risk, and commitment. Mutuality for me is, again, central to this idea of really understanding the other, thinking about the person who you are interacting with in a way that is going to be beneficial for both sides. Um, propinquity, that sort of engagement in the moment, being present, um, the immediacy of response, I think, is, has continued to show that 
uh, it has continued to be important as we get into different kinds of social media interactivity. Um, and, and again, the, the degrees to which that technology can take us away from face-to-face -face interaction. So um, that's still, still central. Um, empathy, again, entering as Buber would say with that human uh, understanding and characteristics, we can't get away from that in terms of actually having genuine interactions with others. Um, the risk piece, which I think is often glossed over in some of the, the work that doesn't necessarily tackle uh, dialogue at, at the deepest level, asks us to say, well, to recognize, right, that there are unanticipated consequences. There are things that can happen if you ask people what they really want or need, um, you have to listen to them. And so there is always going to be risk involved in that. Um, and there's a vulnerability toward putting yourself forward in that mindset. And finally, to do this effectively, we have to commit ourselves to that moment, to that situation, to the rules of engagement that are laid out for that conversation, um, and to uh, trying as best we can to share that common interpretation of the discussion as it happens. So this gives us um, a, a framework that, again, has been used a lot uh, over the last couple of decades to, to continue to strengthen this work. Um, the last, I think, two pieces here that I'll touch on before we pause. Um, again, now we, we have that kind of foundation in terms of how dialogue has been built in this primary stream of research in public relations. Um, but I really appreciate uh, Petra Tennyson uh, as her work here that reminds us a couple of the key things, right? Sort of steps back from the maybe even a more practical perspective to say, dialogue is still philosophical and abstract. It's still this concept that we need to see as outside of our professional mindset and an organizational mindset. We have to remember, as I said, that it's distinct from symmetry and the two-way symmetrical systems theory based model and understanding. Um, and we also, in contrast to what uh, Pearson said early on, can remember that a dialogic approach isn't necessarily more ethical than a persuasive model in certain circumstances. So she posits that, um, again, we, we, we can't necessarily say that dialogue is more ethical than persuasion depending on the context at hand. And, and as I said in the, from the prior slide, it's always going to be a risk-laden operation. Mm -hmm. So, I would, I would, uh, quick quote from, from this article. Go ahead. Well, I interrupt and mention two things. Petra has a piece called uh, the Per D Model of Dialogue from the Atlantic Journal of Communication, looking at uh, persuasion dialogue synthesis that she, someone might want to look at if you're interested in, uh, in that. And then earlier, I just want to mention for Carl, Carl's work, Carl Botan's piece was, I think, 97 or, or 98. It was almost exactly the same time as ours. And uh, in my defense, we didn't have the internets back then. So I had no idea about Carl's piece <laughs> until years later. And I think Carl was kind of annoyed that uh, we didn't cite Carl. Uh, you know, I didn't cite Carl and Maureen didn't cite him because I didn't even know about his article. So I'm just throwing that out there as Carl's piece is worth looking at and then Petra's piece. If, and if you need either of them, if anybody needs them, just let me know, I'll send them to him. Oh, thank you. The, yeah, the Botan 97, I think it's uh, Botan and Soto 98 um, are both, again, really, really useful pieces there. I, I should have said at the beginning, too, everything that is cited here um, is in a reference list, and I will share that link. Uh, let me just do it now before I forget, and I can do it again at the end. So if you're interested in getting all of this, uh, oh, sorry, one, one second. Well, remind me at the end, I'll go back and grab it. But all of these references are available because I want people to, to make sure that you're, you don't have to write all of this down in a scrambling fashion to, to capture it. But uh, Carl and the, the co-creational uh, model broadly are, you know, are important in that I think they, they really align with this mindset, even though they're, they're looking at slightly different approaches to, to tackling it. So, um, yeah, let me just, I'll, I'll quickly remind us what, what Petra said here, right? Dialogue is not a more balanced form of communication, nor will it automatically result in balance with the environment or ensure harmony in organization stakeholder relationships. So it's not a panacea, it's not a cure-all, um, not that it certainly doesn't have some potential positive benefits, but 
I think it's a good reminder for us and a, a good precursor to a lot of literature since that has questioned dialogue as kind of the, the, the one and only way forward for us. There are a lot of other places that are um, important to look and more things that we can do to help dialogue itself be a, even a more robust approach. All right, oh, of course, I did wanna to touch on quickly uh, Taylor and Kent 2014, which reminds us that engagement is certainly a part of dialogue as well. Um, that through dialogue, through engagement, organizations can help build social capital. These help reinforce um, and are part of the internal workings of, of organizations. I think we don't often, um, you know, we, we tend to think about dialogue and PR as being primarily external. At least that's the, the sort of knee jerk assumption. And I think we should all remember that there's important dialogue that can happen within organizations as well. And that's a, a place where we should often start. Um, and certainly I'll, I'll mention at the end that an area that I think there could be a lot more research. Um, this also lays out really clearly, uh, and this really resonated with me when I first read it, that we have to prepare to do dialogue effectively. Um, we, we have to understand what the responsibilities are from a professional public relations perspective, but also for those, um, again, either internal or external to the organization that the dialogue is with. Both sides have to be prepared and understand what they need to bring to the table to ensure a useful conversation. Um, and next they, they introduce and, and position dialogue sort of on this continuum. Um, so from monologue or, or what they call propaganda uh, on one end of the spectrum, all the way across to where we see dialogue, uh, genuine dialogue with a capital D at the end. Um, which I, you know, I see as a pretty direct precursor to the dialogic ladder that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, they also bring up here, I think, importantly, that there's a difference between dialogue, which is an important orientation and mindset perspective toward doing this process and this work effectively, versus dialogic, the process or procedures um, that are a part of having dialogue. And so I wanted to end this first section um, by, by just reminding us how much stuff there's been over the last couple of years, um, just since 2018, that has really analyzed, reviewed, and given us some meaty findings about what has happened um, in dialogue and public relations. So um, in particular, right, it's always helpful to start with the two special issues. Um, the, the 2018 JPRR issue, as well as the very recent social media and society piece. Um, and, and I think both of those special issues give uh, a lot of different useful perspectives. And I'll touch on a few more articles that are in those in the second half. Additionally, we've seen here the Morehouse and Saffer bibliometric network analysis. So looking at which scholars are important. Um, Summerfelt and Yang's introduction to the, the Journal of Public Relations Research special issue, which I think is a really valuable uh, or brief overview of scholarship and the trajectory so far. Um, and the Wurtz and Zimbris piece, uh, which looks at, I think, a lot of the ways that dialogue has been purported to be used versus how it's actually been used. Um, so again, all, all of those are really useful pieces in terms of summing up where we've been and where we might be able to go next. Um, and so I just wanted to pause here for a second and ask those on the call, I mean, first, obviously, if there are any questions or things that people want to interject, but also what other parts of this history um, are meaningful for you? This is only, you know, that was 25 minutes of coverage. There's a lot um, that we can look at. And I'll, again, sticking to at least what's within PR. Well, you didn't mention, uh... This guy Luke has his piece on, but um, well, well, that's in the second half. We'll get a mock team. So, um, <laughs> I would, uh, I think there's lots of calm people that I would include, but since you did say, you know, NPR, I mean, I think you've hit the, you've hit the key things there. You hit the key pieces. Yeah, we'll okay. have have some calm folks as well. We'll broaden the scope in part two. May I ask a question, please? Um, are co-creation and dialogue synonyms? No. What, what's the difference um, between the concepts? 
Oh, gosh. I think uh, Michael and Maureen might be in a better position to talk about co-creation than I am tonight. But um, my, my understanding, I guess at a, at a basic level, would be that dialogue looks at a very specific process, right? Um, dialogue looks at, at, a, at a, a, a very specific mindset, a moment that we can consider, whereas co-creation is a broader approach um, that's looking at shared meaning among different groups and the role of public relations in creating and facilitating that meaning with different groups. Um, so I, I, would, I would say co-creation is the larger uh, umbrella. Um, does that resonate with others? I think you know all dialogue is co-creational mostly, except for bad dialogue, uh, but not all co-creation involves dialogue. Sorry, do you have an example where co-creation is not dialogue? Yeah, so like right now, um, we're experiencing something together and you could come away with a particular view about um, dialogue that you didn't have before, and we could come to an understanding about dialogue. And, you know, this may or may not be a dialogic setting. Like if we just took the classroom, for example, you could listen to a brilliant lecture by a professor, come away with a completely new understanding of something that you didn't, you never considered and have had no dialogue at all, but you come away with a shared view, the one they started with, they already had, and then you come to embrace it. You now have co-creation you know, a, a co-created meaning. And so I think that happens a lot. Like the media covers issues and topics and we see them and think, oh my goodness, we have to do something about the koala bears or we have to help the environment. And you, you know, I, mean, I don't think anybody tips from one broadcast, but I mean, the idea is just that you can come to a shared agreement, co-creational view of something without having had a dialogue. I think media coverage is a good example, right? Where we have, how many people contribute to a news story before it goes out into the world, right? You have a reporter, you have sources, you have editors who are all contributing at different levels. Then you have the actual dissemination of that information. You have maybe hundreds or thousands or millions of people who are watching it. They're all thinking different things. Today, they might even all be tweeting different things about it and reading those tweets. And so you get all of these different perspectives that are contributing toward some kind of shared understanding of what that event was. And so that's, you know, to me, that's co-creation um, without being dialogue. Maybe our friend Bakhtin sees it a little bit more <laughs> as the potential for dialogue than a uh, Boober mindset would. But yeah, I don't think that that would even really count under, under that, e even a broader understanding of dialogue. So does that help? Yes, uh, actually after reading your paper, um, the 2018 paper on dialogue, I, I thought maybe co-creation and dialogue are synonyms because um, your definition of dialogue in this paper is very, um, is overarching. Like it, it includes listening, it includes shared zones of meanings. Like you have discussion on all of those concepts. So I thought maybe I could consider them as synonyms. Well, that's really interesting because I I never thought of it quite that way, and I think that uh, Octin certainly paints with a broader brush um, and looks at and we'll talk about this in a, in a couple minutes, right? The way that he sees dialogue beyond that kind of one to one as the ideal, um, and I think that that's important, especially for those of us who are as as PR professionals and and scholars thinking about those professionals. Uh, folks who are considering what dialogue means for organizations, right? So I think that there's some value in understanding that perspective, but I still think it's probably a, a smaller circle um, than, than co-creation. Other I, thoughts and questions? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm not uh, like, deep, I didn't deep, deep, deep so so deeply into the dialogue uh, but this as a PR practitioner former PR practitioner so we all were in in in, in this issue I, I would like to ask you 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 made a very interesting uh, review of of different uh, um, articles and and books but um, 
as we are in Australia practically, yes. So why you didn't, uh, yeah, wh why you didn't mention Jim McNamara and his uh, very interesting uh, approach to stakeholders and stake takers? Because, you know, when I read it, 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 it was pretty, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. I, I was very impressed how, uh, how it fits in, in, in what, what, what you represented. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with the with the exact piece that you're referencing, but I will talk more about organizational listening. Um, yeah, so, 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 that, so right? his idea was yeah. that stakeholders is mostly those who are always are stakeholders. So everyone wants to hear mm -hmm. from them. But stake taker, the state stake takers in his definition is those who are very difficult the audiences, publics, which are very uh, difficult to reach. To, to actually to target and to to engage, and that's uh, for example, he, it it was not maybe scientific article. It was most mostly like publicism, you know. When he, uh, it was like a like a very very bright rhetoric, like uh, Professor McNamara likes to 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 write that when he said uh, about. Uh, that uh, organizations, businesses, governments, they always are asking only like prominent, famous journalists and famous NGOs, but a lot of vulnerable people, vulnerable groups are not covered. So. Yeah, no, I, I think that um, on the one hand, Jim has made a, a relative, I would say conscious choice to not situate his work in this tradition over the years, right? He's, he's always separated what he's done in terms of you know, building out the organizational listening architectures and principles, um, you know, talking about the ways that organizations interact with stakeholders. And so I, you know, I think he's used the, the term dialogue occasionally, but he hasn't done, he hasn't situated his work deeply within this mindset. Um, and I think he's done it in part because, I, not to speak on his behalf, um, I barely know the guy, <laughs> but he, you know, he's, He's always come from a, a practice first mindset in, in his work. Um, and certainly when, when you're there, you're, you're not necessarily starting with terms like propinquity, right? We're not coming from a, a perspective that's really putting the philosophy as, as a goal and then trying to live it rather than finding out the best ways to, to practice first and building that out. So I think it's just a different starting point. I think if you look, it, you know, if you read his stuff deeply over the years, it, there are probably a lot of places where it overlaps um, mm -hmm. and is trying to achieve the same things. I, I think Jim is really pro-business, not in any kind of negative way, but I mean, he's really pro-organization. And he sees research as a tool to make good decisions and as a tool to, tool to find out what needs to be done. And he sees, he has, you know, dialogue is, is, you know, I don't think he'd try to, to pervert dialogue for that purpose, but at the same time, his goal, my take, I mean, I know Jim fairly well, you know, being a colleague here, um, is that it's, you know, for the good of the organization that he's working for. He's trying to solve their problem. He's trying to deal with that issue. And that's perfectly okay if you're conducting a dialogue ethically. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think he sees dialogue as sort of an end in itself. I think he does see dialogue as, as useful as part of a research strategy. And the organization should use that information to make good decisions. Tool, a useful tool, right? But not necessarily a, an end in itself. Yeah, well said. Um, may right, I ask any, another any... question? Yes. Please go ahead. Um, do you see any relationship between the concept of dialogue and uh, other concepts in public relations? For example, concepts like participatory culture, like legitimacy, like identification. Because, for example, to um, to um, lead people to identify with us, we need to have dialogue with them. To build our, our legitimacy, we need to have dialogue with uh, our publics. Um, participatory culture might be a reflection of dialogue. Um, or, or when we are talking about networking and building coalition, again, we need to have dialogue with our publics. What's the relationship between these concepts and dialogue? So I, on the one hand, I feel like that's a, a lifetime of research to try to answer that, <laughs> that, that individual question, right? Which is wonderful. That's exactly what 
Anne said at the beginning, right? The joy of diving yeah. into these concepts is that in a way it connects with everything. Um, the caution from my perspective is that if dialogue is everything and everything's dialogue, then it's nothing, right? That's the danger that we hit on at the very beginning. So I think it's important to keep in mind that it's, it's helpful to have some boundaries around what we're talking about. We can argue about what those are, right? That's the fun part, but we, we need to have some kind of understanding of where the central part of dialogue ends and what might be an outgrowth or result of that, right? Versus something that's really truly a part of that concept. Um, and again, I think if you start in a different place, if you start with Buber, if you start with Bakhtin, if you start with Habermas, you're going to get to a different answer, right? About what falls into that, uh, you know, in, internal bucket versus the, the sort of external uh, outflow or outgrowth of, of doing this kind of work. So great question. And, you know, as a grad student, you have a long time to figure out your answers to it, right? We have whole careers to work on this stuff, which is exciting. Yes, actually, I've proposed, um, uh, I've written an abstract for a conference and for ANSCO, which is in July. And uh, in my abstract, um, I've proposed that I would explore the public relations uh, scholarship in order to um, uh, explore co-creation, how co-creation is reflected in the scholarship. Um, by, by reading the papers, I think in all papers, all theories have a level of co-creation. So when I'm exploring co-creation, I don't necessarily need to limit myself on a specific theories like dialogue, listening, engagement. But even when I'm reading about legitimacy, uh, I might um, be able to say something about co-creation, like the level of co-creation or how co-creation is reflected uh, in this theory. I don't know if um, I could successfully write a paper on it, but as you said, it, is, it looks very daunting. It is, um, it needs, a, 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 I don't know, many years of research in order to build this connection. And uh, as you said, it might not be a very good approach to try to build connection between all, all these concepts. It might be a better idea to keep them separate. I think one at a time when we're making connections is probably a decent place to start at least. Um, and trying to keep those connections as logical as, and as, uh, I hate to say it like this, but as obvious to others, right? As sort of self-evident as, as we can make them, um, the easier it is to have work that's gonna be uh, understood and sold <laughs> in, to use that term, right? To conferences and, and, uh, and journals and, and then read and respected by others. So I, I think that, you know, that think, as long as we're all thinking about those issues in terms of what we're doing now, we're, we're on the right track. Um, and the work of going through those is the work of building theory and scholarship. And that's the, that's the fun part. So and I think that's a great transition to what I wanna talk about in the second half in terms of what other ideas can I pull in or can, and can we all examine that could be a part of this work? Um, and again, feel free to jump in with other questions or comments uh, as we go. All right, so alternative directions and new perspectives. So I wanted to start with this list, um, which I, I first ran across this kind of understanding uh, when I read Anne's dissertation, uh, which is the, the lane 2014 there, which says, well, look, we have all of these people who have written about dialogue in different contexts, and they all have slightly different understandings of what dialogue is and how it works. Um, and it can be useful to, to understand and to integrate some of their philosophies. Um, and this is my sort of my very uh, uh, <clears throat> not particularly well, <laughs> not particularly deep uh, uh, points, but from, from my perspective, yes, we've looked at Bakhtin, yes, we've looked at Buber, yes, we've looked at Habermas. Um, but outside of a little bit of work by, by Michael, and uh, Maureen and Anne, we haven't really looked at most of these others in great detail as part of dialogue in PR scholarship. Um, Bohm, Gadamer have, I think, some really interesting ideas about uh, how, how dialogue functions, how it can function in groups, how it can function in uh, democratic society. Rogers, as I mentioned before, who I, 
I believe has been pulled into other parts of, of PR, but not necessarily as deeply in a dialogic context. Again, we might be able to learn something from that patient uh, uh, therapist relationship. Um, and then Frere has come into most recently that Kenton Taylor 2021 piece, um, looking at dialogue and social change, social activism, um, but again, certainly more within his work that we can pull from. So this is not a complete list, but I think it's a really useful place to start in terms of where else could we go to augment our understandings of dialogue um, and potentially bring some other ideas in that could be useful for us. Another place where we can go, and this is, speaks to, to Michael's point a few minutes ago, we can look at some other voices just within the communication uh, field that have contributed their understandings of dialogue over the years. We don't really have a great uh, connective, you know, connective points with the most recent scholarship that's going on on dialogue in other areas of COM, um, for, for better or worse. So a couple of places to start. Um, the work of Anderson, Cisna, and Arnett, um, their 94 edited volume, The Reach of Dialogue, has a lot of useful perspectives that I think um, are, are helpful. They were insightful for me when I was looking at, at uh, Bakhtin as part of my 2018 piece. Um, the Anderson and Cisna special issue uh, of Com Theory in 2008, I think, is another useful one. Um, and then Ron Arnett's work, um, going all the way back to 86, he wrote a book about Buber that I'm, I haven't read, and I'm not sure that anyone has uh, who are doing this work. That could be an interesting place um, for us to, again, get another useful, calm perspective on Buber. Um, and has, he's also written on Levinas and going beyond I and So again, I think there's a lot of work here that I, I should, among others, start to look into as more places where we can learn and add to our scholarship on dialogue just from the communication field. There may be others that folks can think of um, that, that would be helpful. Again, people who are out there, maybe even still publishing and, and writing in this area, uh, our, our neighbors. Go ahead. I uh, was just also, um, Marguerite Toledano has looked at Buber's earlier work. And, yep. um, you know, and I think there's an argument to be made that Buber was a public relations scholar because he engaged in a lot of activist work to try to, to push Zionism and, and to try to get his views across. And so he has a very, um, uh, she's got some nice pieces looking at that. And then I would also add to this list, Lang and, uh, and Nell Noddings. Nell Noddings looks, okay. at, uh, um, looks at care. And I think that's one of the things we actually could benefit from, as you suggested, you know, Will Rod, you know, Rogers might be of use to us. I think any of these alternate perspectives could be of use to us too, you know, and we spend so little time, I think, in PR worrying about our stakeholders, you know, 99% of all crisis research is about doing what's best for the organization. And they say, well, the first thing to do is to make sure the stakeholders are okay. But, you know, truth be told, stakeholders are second, I think, to most organizational interests. So I would just say Nell Noddings, um, Lang, um, you've already mentioned Freer, but I would throw those yeah. out too. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Thank you. And, and uh, Marguerite's 2018 piece, I, I didn't mention it, but it was on one of the lists a few slides back and it's in the references as well. So you can get a, at least a place to start. I think she cites her, her older stuff in that one. So um, you can have, have it going back if you're interested. Yeah, her, her stuff I think is, again, some of the most interesting recent um, pieces that have taken dialogue in different directions as well. And she's got a chapter so, in that edited book that Maureen did with uh, Maureen, uh, Taylor. Maureen, you're on the call, right? She was here. She was in uh, the Handbook of Communication Engagement or? Uh, no, um, the one with. No, uh, older one? Okay. Well, I forget. We have a chapter and it's a, it's, so if you look up, uh, if you look up Toledano, it'll come up if you go to her Google, Google Scholar page or something and you'll find it. But she's got um, a book, uh, edited volume. It was, the, it was the book of the year, um, the uh, Pride Book Award from several years ago when it came out. So uh, it's called, uh, it's the PR and Divided Societies. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's a uh, uh, Somerville, uh, Hargy, Taylor, and Teledano. 2017 Public Relations and Divided Societies. And she's got a really good chapter on dialogue uh, with the Israeli Palestinian situation. So look that up. And I, if you don't have it, Luke, I can scan it and send it to yeah. you. Oh, thank you. 
which I think is a great transition to the, <laughs> the next direction that I wanted to look at, starting with um, one of my favorite more you know, se semi-recent pieces here, which is the uh, Get Shiv Ganesh and Heather Zoller dialogue and activism. And this, you know, everything really that we've talked about so far has been dialogue as I think they would call it collaboration. So really the idea of dialogue toward a shared end, um, consensus as the end goal. Uh, and again, a little bit oversimplifying, but the, the idea that we should be working together and envisioning the, the ends of dialogue as being productive, working together to find some kind of shared common ground, shared meaning. Uh, shared meaning creation in those moments. But this article reminds us that there are other ways that we can reasonably conceive of dialogue and that those can be important for us as well. Um, I think the, the examples of dialogue and name only could be, you know, fall under this area of co-optation, right? People using this term of dialogue for maybe nefarious purposes, just not uh, with a genuine uh, you know, desire to, to have the kind of mutuality that we expect, um, given the, the kind of standard definitions we've discussed. But the third, and I think to me, the, the most interesting contribution here is this idea of dialogue in an agonistic context. Um, and so in, in that mindset, we're really centering the conflict that can come up in these interactions, the differences in power, the differences between people. Um, and again, it moves dialogue and shows us that dialogue can exist in a universe where we're not only thinking about that consensus mindset as the end goal, right? That we're looking at other ways that you can have those kinds of conversations. Um, and so they bring this up in the context of activism and say that if you are a genuine activist for your cause, if you are advocating for your cause, um, you're really only going to be able to use dialogue in a mindset of social change and embracing your own principles and believing in them in a way where you wouldn't necessarily be able to have the same kind of uh, distinction between, uh, or uh, I should say, the, the same kind of uh, giving yourself over, right, to the other that we would see in an I and thou mindset. So activism can include this kind of dialogue, but it has to be, uh, I think, more in an agonistic sense. Um, agonism, if you're not familiar, is, again, uh, from the, the rhetorical tradition, um, you know, going all the way back to the Greeks. Uh, Davidson 2016 is probably, of those citations at the bottom, the deepest read on, on agonistic mindsets within public relations. Um, but the idea broadly is just that we're, that ideas should be fighting with each other. There should be conflict. That's healthy for democratic societies. It's healthy for public relations as part of an advocacy role. But again, that's, this is a very, very different mindset than the kind of dialogue we've been talking about um, the rest of the evening. And so it's important to, to, again, see how they might both fit under the same dialogue umbrella within public relations or whether they should. Um, I should just say before I move on, the other pieces uh, mentioning here, uh, Erica Sizek, who's I believe a speaker on this series a few months down the road, um, along with Nika Logan wrote a really wonderful piece that was part of the JPRR special issue in 2018 about dissensus um, and dialogue as part of organizations kind of consciously engaging in conflict uh, and conversations around conflict. Um, so that's a really useful one. Again, I mentioned the, the Kent and Taylor 2021 piece that talks about dialogue and activism, um, as well as Stephanie Madden and Rebecca Alt's 2021 piece that talks about social justice, social media, um, and kind of shared conversations in the context of open dialogue. Uh, and now uh, I'll talk a little bit about my article here. Um, and, uh, you know, again, always, always fun to talk about work that, that you've done. I, I started thinking about this one um, from the perspective of among and between. And again, going back to the foundations that we have of Buber and Rogers, really looking at one-to-one -one dialogue as the ideal, one of the things that that 
uh, struck for me again as a, a former practitioner and someone who's uh, you know always looking for for work and theory building that resonates with that practitioner part of my brain that's still there is this idea that really we're, we're rarely in practice talking only to one person. Um, the vast majority of the work that we do is really talking among vast groups of people, trying to manage the interactions among those groups. And so the first time that I read Bakhtin's understanding of dialogue, I really felt how that resonated with a broader understanding of dialogue as being among a lot of groups rather than just between. And this is uh, something that I think we, we need to work on across the board in PR scholarship and PR theory building. Um, if we look at the, the ways that our, our OPR or organization public relationship models are constructed, it's all about looking at a sort of one-to-one -one relationship between an organization and a, a stakeholder or public, um, uh, which again, I don't think always makes sense. It's more helpful sometimes to see it from a network perspective or looking at how these organizations interact uh, among uh, other people within this sort of ecological community. Uh, that's a much more realistic understanding of what organizations are up against and what PR practitioners have to do. And so that was really part of why I, I enjoyed diving into this work. A couple of the words that uh, I think are, are useful to unpack, um, there are a lot of Bakhtin's words that are less useful to unpack if you've read him, uh, but a couple that I thought were, were helpful here, this idea of the utterance. So we're not just looking at words as uh, existing individually, but we're working about, or we're, we're really thinking about the individual message as a unit of meaning by itself. Um, so I think that that's a, a, a way that is particularly useful when we're looking at conversation, that we have different iterations within a broader conversation that can potentially lead to dialogue. Um, we also need to think about using his term, the heteroglossia, or these layers of context and meaning that inform what we're doing. That, uh, you know, essentially when we communicate, there's a lot that goes unsaid, um, and there's a lot of layer within the words that we choose that comes across within societies at different times um, using different languages. And so understanding both the, the need to, to chunk communication in this utterance format and mindset, as well as the, all of the layers and implications from the words that we choose um, in this context like heteroglossia, really I think it, it is a good explanation for the work of day-to-day -day PR practitioners in navigating the kind of communication that they need to do um, in both traditional channels like media relations, as well as digital and social channels. Um, so broadly, Bakhtin is coming to this party of dialogue as a literary scholar. So he's looking at uh, dialogue in the sense of, I write a book, and then you respond to it by writing a book. I write a piece of criticism about your book. Um, and so there are these ideas that are kind of floating up in the air. They are public, which is, uh, I think, inherently different than a lot of what we've heard in terms of what dialogue is and should be from Buber and uh, Rogers and others. Um, and also, it's not as uh, timely in the same sense. We don't have that same idea of propinquity uh, to the degree that it matters in a one-on-one, face-to-face, -on -one, -face, in-person interaction. So that all changes the way that we have to see what dialogue is and what it can be. So for me, in this mindset, um, Yes, I agree, Michael, right? This, this puts us more in a Habermasian place where we're thinking about what's going on in the public sphere rather than just what's going on within this room or within this organization. Um, and so this, to me, gives some pretty clear roles to practitioners that I think are, are useful, right? We are folks who can be cultural interpreters, understanding what's going on within these different uh, communities among these different groups, translating among or between different groups. We are folks who care about meaning um, and might end up acting as, uh, as you know, the, the term that I use here, stewards of meaning or trying to adjust or change the meaning of different terms, different organizations, uh, different 
services different issues, right, in, in different contexts. Um, and finally, I think it gives us power as, to, to come back around to Jim McNamara's work, organizational listeners. So a, as an important part of being the eyes and ears of the organization in that context, this understanding of dialogue, again, a little bit uh, broader and certainly more public, puts us in the position of, of interpreting the world around us, bringing that information back to the organization and helping to communicate it, um, which is kind of the, the center of uh, organizational listening and the, the architectures of listening. So again, this is a different, this is a different approach to dialogue than we've heard from before, but one that I think has the, again, some potential to open up a couple of different paths. And despite some of the, the uh, all of those consonants in both of those words, I think the concepts behind utterance and heteroglossia are things that actually would really resonate with people who are doing this work every day if you explained to them what they were. So I think it's a, a, another, a different way in um, that gives us, again, some different results uh, to, to speak to, to Sheena's question before. Um, any, any questions on Bakhtin before I keep going? I'll just throw a few more things at you before we, we turn it to sort of Q&A and discussion. I would just say, I see Bakhtin and Gadamer as being in the same camp. And mm -hmm. I think that we need some piece sort of contextualizing how we do something with that. Because you, you mentioned we need to look more at Bakhtin, but it's a completely foreign view to I think what we mostly see in public relations. And I think that needs to be translated in some sort of useful way. Not in, you know, not that your piece isn't useful. Oh, sure. Just that it's like our 2018 piece. Um, you know, I, I think if we had started with the 2002 piece on theory, it would have been less well received because there was no framework for it. So yeah. I think we did it backwards, but the 2000, whatever it was, the 2009, <laughs> 1998 piece the 98 piece let us say look we can extend public relations look we can bring new things in i think we already have that now but um i think that would be helpful would be to sort of say what do we do with Bakhtin and Gadamer? you know how do we apply them which again i i think speaks to the what is the purpose of this work in a lot of cases it's to build bridges among these different areas and to find and you, know, you can't build this before you build this part of the bridge. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's a great point that I, there's been a divide between the kind of Uber camp and the Habermasian camp, right? It, if there's an easy way to split those two, right? People who are thinking about dialogue in a very narrow sort of interpersonal first uh, sense almost, right? Versus those who are thinking about dialogue as, as public conversation. And maybe merely public conversation, um, you know, in in the Habermasian piece. And I know that's oversimplifying, but no, and, and that's where Bob Heath is. I mean, Bob Heath yeah. is solidly in that I think Habermasian camp, even though there's that dialogue piece with those like twelve authors having the discussion stuff like that um, to <laughs> make you think that Bob is part of that school, but he's not. Bob, I think, is solidly in that sort of Jim McNamara. You know, organizations um, use dialogue to find out what people think, and then they respond to their publics to, you know, to for a fully functioning society. I so I think it's a, you know, there's clear people in those camps. It's you know, not that one is better than the other. So we have some work to do, which is good, um, because we all need to publish things, right? Um, excellent. I'll, I'll keep rolling just to, again, throw a, a last couple of things at you and then we can, can uh, talk a little bit more broadly about it. Um, one of my favorite pieces that I've read over the last couple of years is Anne's Dialogic Ladder, uh, Anne Lane 2020, which really takes um, that continuum that we saw, I think, in Taylor and Kent 2014, if I remember correctly, and says, well, let's actually put this in a place where we can help people move up, um, help people get closer to genuine dialogue. So this starts by reminding us, again, and, and this is, is uh, I think, squarely in that uh, Buber camp, there is this thing, genuine or true dialogue, capital D dialogue, it's narrow, it's rare, it's valuable. 
um, our orientation to that, as we've just been saying, cannot just be instrumental. It cannot be a means to an end. It cannot be a tool. It has to be something that we're doing for, in essence, the right reasons, right? Because we care about others, because we have empathy, um, because we're trying to help find some kind of mutuality or common ground. Um, and then again, she, she reminds us that there are multiple characteristics that we need in terms of getting to that place. Um, but if they're conscious about it, people who are practicing this work can actually say, well, I see that I'm here right now, but let's try to move up and get closer to the top. And there's benefit to getting moving in that direction, even if we don't get all the way there. So here is the ladder. Um, and this reminds us that there are, there are practices that reflect some aspects of dialogue, but are still not what we would consider true dialogue. We can have two-way communication, we can have interaction, um, and those aren't necessarily bad, that's part of, of doing this work, but it's not dialogue. And maybe in certain cases, we can continue to move upward by adding the same things that uh, remind us of uh, you know, what that genuine connection is, right? Mutuality, propinquity, empathy, risk, commitment, um, all of those pieces can help us move toward it. And we might not be able to get all of them all the time, but maybe we can get two. Maybe last year we got one and this year we can get three, right? And I think that's the sort of mindset that can really help uh, these kinds of concepts get integrated into practice um, in, in deep ways um, and in ways that practitioners can respond to. So, and I, I don't mean to, to describe that in a way that makes dialogue look like we're only checking that box, if that makes sense, right? Um, we obviously need to have uh, that genuine interaction. We need to have that mutuality in terms of the orientation more broadly. But I think this is, this is one of my favorite ways that um, I know if I show this to practitioners, they can understand exactly how they could do better to improve their work in this field. And I think it's also generative from a theory building perspective, because it allows us to maybe apply this in more contexts, to do more work as scholars, where we can integrate these concepts into you know, real world situations and learn from that. Um, I, I feel like I should ask, if there, ask Anne if there's anything she wants to add. If she's still on. I'm, I am still here. Oh, there we go, my camera. No, I'm sitting here blushing furiously. Um, that's an extremely comprehensive and uh, I think you've gone to the heart of what I was trying to do and that has made me feel my existence is justified for another day so thank you very much for that it was all about translating a lot of these very um, esoteric out there theoretical concepts and going okay but what does it look like how can we conceptualize these and when you say you could show that to practitioners and they'd know how to get nearer and how to use that as a as a uh, not, I'm not going to use the word an evaluative tool, but there you go. I, I like that very much. Thank you. No, you're spot on. Thank you. Um, and yeah, glad to hear it. I, I, I was joking with Michael the other day that I keep referring people back to this piece um, because I feel like so many who are trying to find a way into dialogue as scholars, um, this is a great place for them to start. Um, and I think just, again, helps them to get, get situated in this universe. I, I'm seeing Maureen's hand, I believe. Yay, yes. Uh, so I just wrote this in the text, actually. So, you know, I've been listening uh, to your, your story, right? Because essentially you're, you're taking us through the story. And this is actually going to be a really good um, uh, video for our PhD students, our undergraduates, and our master's students to watch. Because I think it's going to help them access in a very easy to understand approach what dialogue is and get them ready for thinking about it as practitioners. But I wrote in, my, um, in the text box was, as I listened to your story of the evolution of dialogue and the alternative paths, right? And the different trees and the branches and everything else. It makes me wonder, have other conceptual areas in our field gone through this type of introspective? Because I can't see this happening around excellence or OPR, right, of, uh, of the deep discussion of the philosophy of the underlying concepts, assumptions, uh, the baggage that comes with it. So I'm saying, I, I just think it's interesting. I, I feel like the, the field of dialogue is, and maybe it's because we're so conceptual, 
because our practicality has yet been uh, put into action. But it strikes me is that we've really, especially through your presentation, we've gone through the whole, the whole shebang and asked the big questions that other, other areas really haven't. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe one of you on the, on the call can say, oh no, we've done it in blank, but I don't think we have. Oh, in the early OPR research, there is some thought about what is the key thing we should be describing. And the way we arrive at, at uh, relationships, there's that discussion about should we be focused on relationships? Uh, what article? There's one article. Yeah, chap I think there was a couple, couple times mentioned in chapters. But yes, no big discussion of it, no like questioning of it. It was sort of thrown out there and then they moved forward with it. Okay. That's all. I'm taking my hand down. I took it down. Oh, <laughs> no, I need, that's one that I need to think about too. Um, again, I, I don't think we've seen it in excellence. Um, no. I don't think we've seen it in crisis. Um, we've, yeah. we've just seen branches <laughs> from the crisis tree, I think, as, as people have, have disagreed or found other, mm -hmm. other things that are important, right? There, and, and not necessarily the um, any desire to, to bring everything together and think about what the best path is forward as a whole. So, um, well, uh, two things though, in, uh, uh, in crisis, uh, I've started talking about this and questioning it, but it's come really late. Crisis is very monolithic, uh, in terms of how they do it. But in, um, what was I thinking in, uh, oh, and then there's Bob's piece that's sort of a post very late in the game critique of OPR. So it's interesting that, like as Maureen said, there, was, there seems to have been no real discussion in the grounding of these theories in the early days. What are they? Where should they be doing? What should we be thinking about? But then after the fact, you've got people raising these questions saying, shouldn't we be worrying about this? Shouldn't we be worrying about that? And it seems like all we do is worry about that. Or this. Or this. All right, sorry. I will let Luke go back to- uh... oh, that, was, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, and, and again, I, I think it's good for, I, I think we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard here, right? I mean, that's part of the, that's an, uh, that's an expectation as, as people who are doing this kind of work that we're going to be thinking about these issues because this theory building is important to us. But yes, that doesn't mean that we can't help others to find that same reflectivity or reflexiveness, reflection um, in their own areas, so. All right, onward, the last couple of things that I want to touch on here um, after the latter are just to say, again, we have even more fun stuff that is being published um, on dialogue in different places very, very recently. Um, and some of it not even quite yet. Uh, you know, I think looking at affordances is a really interesting path to digital dialogue. Uh, Alvin Shu and Sifan Su, um, you know, looking at that work. You're seeing work on indigenous resistance, um, you know, Mohan Dutta, you're seeing LGBTQ publics from Erica Sizek, again, who will be on this uh, it, it position, I believe in a few months, um, the work on where is the end of dialogue, which is, a, again, I think a super important question that we have not answered. Um, uh, Oyvind Ilan and Abby Leventius, as well as uh, Michael and Anne's 2021 piece, I think have really given us a good grounding for trying to answer those questions, uh, but there's certainly more that can be done there. And then even more from uh, Katie Place and, and Erica on the subaltern perspective and power as part of dialogue. These are all such important questions and I'm, I'm glad to see people tackling them. Um, as I was doing this, um, my, my problem as a scholar is that I always have 15 more ideas than I can write about at a given moment. Maybe some of you are in the same boat. Um, and so these were things that came up to me, reflecting on everything that I was about to say today that would be good ideas for next steps. I'd love to write in more detail on propinquity and temporality as part of dialogue. I think there's a lot of space to explore that. Um, I think as I sort of uh, alluded to earlier, I think we can do more to talk about internal communication and dialogue within organizations. That's a place that um, I think is a, an, an easy fit um, where there hasn't been a lot of work to expand on, on what's been done and, and to clearly situate those contexts. Um, to build on uh, Anne's 2014 list of 
these all of these important kind of philosophers of dialogue, I'm sure that there are more non-Western perspectives that are out there that I don't know about that others can bring to the table. So I'd love to hear about culturally what's beyond um, the, the canon that I've been exposed to most in terms of defining and understanding what dialogue is. I think we need to do more to start applying the, the dialogic ladder as well as some of these other principles in more situations um, to more contexts in a lot of different, using a lot of different methodologies that we haven't done yet. Um, and I think there's space to do more to connect with uh, the work that's been done in organizational listening. Um, I think that, that there are possibilities there to, to start to pull that <laughs> more in a dialogic direction in useful ways. So, um, but I would love to hear, I, I am done. Um, I would love to hear more about what all of you, where you want to go, what other questions you have, what else might be fun to talk about and discuss while we're all together this evening. Uh, I'll say that I have one chapter by a Chinese scholar on Chinese dialogue that is not new. It's been around for know, 20 years, but it's an excellent chapter because they looked at this dialogue that took place between some young people and um, party members and the party members expected the young people to come in and be deferent and to follow the rules of protocol of Chinese society and the young scholars assumed or at least treated it like a genuine dialogue, a chance to say what they wanted to say. And of course, the elders, you know, the older people were unhappy that they were so disrespectful and the young people, you know, were, were unhappy that they didn't really want to talk. So it's a great piece. I'm happy to send it to anybody who wants it. Well, that's great. And I'm, I know there's more out there, right, in terms of those mm -hmm. uh, culturally situated understandings and perspectives. Yeah. And Luke, I, uh, one of the pieces that I'd like you to think about, and Michael, maybe consider inviting Rhonda Zaharna at American University has this wonderful piece about relationships. And she goes through different cultures. And she says, in this culture, the relationship is like a hand. It's you, your family, your friends, your community. And I think that is a piece that we need to return to. It wasn't published. This is an interesting story for you scholars, the young scholars on the call. So she didn't publish it in public relations. She published it in Com Theory, which is arguably one of our top journals in communication. But because it wasn't in public relations, it has 25 sites, which is a lot, normally a lot, right? You'd say, oh my gosh, it's a lot. But 25 sites is like nothing in the scope of public relations where stronger articles get 500 or three, even just 100 or 200. So Rhonda Saharna's piece, on relationships is truly something that I think informs dialogue because we always are still taking this one-to-one -one or one-to-org dialogic approach. And she's arguing that there are so many different ways that relationships that, uh, that already exist before we even start engaging them. So Luke, I, I think I would look at that piece and if you don't have it, I can send it to you because I, I keep it alive. Yeah, I read it, it's a wonderful one. I think I'm one it's of those 25. <laughs> I think so too, exactly, exactly. And it's, it's actually a really interesting story about, you know, our schools want us to publish in uh, those larger journals, right? The comm journals and the, the marketing journals, but the real impact in our field comes when you publish in the, in the PR journals, because then the PR people read it. So either shame on us for not reading outside and uh, Deborah, it's Zaharna, it's Z-A-H-A-R-N-A. -A -A. And she's at American University. Thank you, Luke, okay. Um, actually, I was gonna say, Maureen, we should talk about this you know, as a board member because there are, I think, several good pieces that were published outside of the field over the years. And, it, and it's been a common practice to reprint articles, you know, seminal articles that have been out for 20 years. And so it might be worth considering a special issue, republishing some of those seminal pieces. Or maybe asking people to take it one step further, because yeah. that was in 2014, maybe, because we were still at Oklahoma when it was published. Mm -hmm. So it's been, you know, eight years. So maybe that's something I could do with PR Review, is to ask people to, uh, to update their really seminal pieces that came into other journals. 20 yeah. anniversary of a tour. Well, actually, and I'm going to tell you a funny story, and Michael can confirm. On, on 2019, 20, 20 years after our dialogic piece, the 1999 piece that everybody cites, Michael and I opened up three bottles of champagne and read the 1999 piece and recorded it. 
and had a discussion about all the sentences, like who wrote what and no, no, I wrote that. And he's like, no, I wrote that. So we actually have a recording of the 1999 piece. It's probably a little bit embarrassing as it gets towards the end on dialogue, but uh, we do have it. <laughs> but we actually 20th anniversary. So somebody could do a special issue of 20 years after the theory piece release it <laughs> all right i'm shutting up i was going to put on the sydney lectures but i didn't want to you know i, I didn't want to re-listen to it to see if there was something bad in it where we went off yeah i think we, we'll wait 20 more years and listen to it again P private releases all right let me i'm going to stop sharing my screen um but before i do i will just point everyone to the references so yeah, you, they're yeah. all there if you send as soon as I get out of it i'll share the link so that everyone can have access yeah if you you can share it in the comments that's usually the best way and then if you want to yeah. if you want to send me the slides i can make them available to people excellent i have a, a quick question for you luke um please first of all i need to acknowledge that was a really seriously interesting presentation i know it's because an area that i'm interested in but it was of itself a really interesting presentation i've made copious notes i think i've got ideas for at least three new papers here so you know what gee thanks for that one of my Excellent. bottom drawer is already overflowing but you know that's how it rolls um i'd love your thoughts on and this is something that i, that I touched on in my um original thesis in 2014 is this schism between how do you do dialogue as a practitioner when you might be all across all these propinquity and blah, 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 but you are working for an organization that has already made a decision so propinquity is out of the window so we know it can't be uh, um, true dialogue and you're working with stakeholder groups publics who hate each other's guts who hate the organization, but you're gonna try and make it as dialogic as possible as the practitioner. That puts you in the really invidious position of either selling yourself out morally and saying, you know, hey, let's talk about whether we should build this bridge when the decision's already been made. Or do you say, you know what, this is all actually meaningless, but tell us what you think. I hate that phrase, tell us what you think. I'd love to know whether you've thought about focusing on that, that tension, that dialectic tension that the poor practitioner has to resolve every single day of how can I progress up that ladder? How can I be more dialogic when I know what dialogue is and I know how much better it could be for everyone, but I can't impose it. A, it's beyond my power and B, ironically, it's antithetical to dialogue. Go. So the, the way that I skirt that question in my work, because I think it's such a difficult one to answer is by looking outside of consensus related uh, approaches. And so that's one of the reasons that I've really enjoyed the, the kind of trajectory from that uh, Ganesh and Zoller piece that I mentioned. Um, and I'd put in other other things here that have been good for me. Um, the Coombs and Holiday 2018 Social Issues Management uh, piece, if you're familiar with that one, um, as well as some of the work that's on, on corporate social advocacy. Um, and so it, a lot of places that are looking at centering conflict and starting there in terms of rather than starting from the perspective of dialogue. Um, and in a lot of ways, I, you know, I don't think that I've, I've gotten to a place where I'm comfortable building that particular bridge yet. Um, if I'm, if I'm being honest, right. And that's, that's something that I, we, we still have some work to do to try to figure out how to get people from a place where there may be opportunities for dialogue, but it's it's never going to be, or it's never going to solve all of the problems, right? right. So um, the the last thing I'll say uh, before Marina is that I, I have a, a diagram where I actually split our kind of potential responses to these kinds of situations into four options, right? And one of them is an arena where dialogue is possible. If we think about, uh, if you're familiar with contingency theory, mm -hmm. right? Contingency theory has the, you know, complete acquiescence or accommodation on one end, thank you. And then uh, uh, fighting for your perspective, complete advocacy on the other end. So if we, if we use that as one axis and then make the other axis 
consensus at the top and dissensus at the bottom. That gives us a way to plot out really any of our, mm -hmm. you know, the traditional PR responses in a way that can tell us, well, is dialogue a possibility here or isn't it? Um, and so that's, that's the way that I've tried to start figuring that out. Um, but as you might imagine, it's getting, it's, it's working through its way through the process. <laughs> and actually, there are things to think about. Yeah. Right. But look, I think you actually have a, um, a good, you have the contingency theory. It's already established, right? We actually have yeah. an upcoming special issue in public relations review, shameful. True. Plug, yeah. But uh, to actually put that in. And one of the things I've discovered is I'm teaching a class with the business school here in, at University of Technology, Sydney. And we're teaching about alternative emergent approaches to business, right? And one of the, mm. uh, one of the theories is called from the boardroom to the town hall. And it makes people who are making decisions think about what would happen to the decision if it was made in public, right? Mm. Instead of in the closed boardroom with all the people and all the economics and all of that, what if you actually made the discussion of how that bridge, like that Anne's talking about, or that infrastructure project, and the initial discussions were in the community first, instead of selling it to the community afterwards. And I think that's our, our task. Our task is to actually, for us to actually get A, publishing in the business journals, number one. Number two, collaborating with our business colleagues on writing and thinking and co-teaching so that people who are leaving and going into business have this as, a, as in the back, right? We're not going to get it in the front because they're worried about business and bottom line and ROI, but we put it in there and we let it fester. We let Fred work on it, right? And maybe they're in a position of power in a few years where they can actually start that. So I think it's it's not only us, but I think we need to start earlier on that dialogic process to how decisions are made and how communities are empowered to say, if you wanna do business in our community, we wanna have influence over it. And that's really hard because right now communities are giving away influence by lower taxes or no taxes or lower environmental rules. So I just think that part of this is actually getting to the business side of it, because we come in so late and we're so limited, as Anne said, yeah. we're, are, are, we're really just trying to get them to buy into the idea and figure out what color they want it to be rather than whether or not it should be. What I hope is the opportunity here in, in, my, in my optimistic moments is mm -hmm. that the shifts like um, what happened with the, the business roundtable announcement in the U.S., uh, gosh, probably two years ago now, um, that said business is not just about making profit. Business is about contributing to society. Um, the the shifts um, that we've seen again over the past year in the, COVID, the, pro the protests yeah. related to George Floyd, with mm -hmm. COVID, with lots of different things, we're seeing um, I think a increased need for the leaders of businesses to respect. Uh, the mindsets of stakeholders and increased looking to PR practitioners and communicators who are in those leadership positions to help facilitate um, that perspective, right? And that's where we will have these opportunities. Maybe they will be fleeting, but we, we will have them at least uh, occasionally to make an impact and push things in the right direction. Um, and I know that there were at least moments, even in my short PR career, where I was able to do that with with organizations, right? And so it's not it's not a pie in the sky thing. No. Um, if you can build trust with with people who are and leading organizations, if we, if we teach our students now the the dialogic frameworks and society and social license to operate, then organizations don't just operate, right? Kim, I think she had to leave, but they have a special issue that's on social license to operate, and that it's actually the community that gives the license to operate, not that the corporation decides where it goes. If we can flip that over time, over the next 20 years. So we have our students at business schools, communication programs, public relations, media, coming out with that, that, that change. I think we have a chance and we've made a lot of progress in 20 years and we'll make more progress in 20 more years. All right, I'm sh I'll shut up. All right, what other questions do we have? My question is, do you have my email address? That's seriously, and we, we need to talk. Absolutely. Good. 
I can send you hits if you don't have it. They can harass them and stalk them. Um, building on your like future opportunities for developing dialogue in non-Western contexts, I thought in, it might be useful to explore dialogue in contexts where there, there is no freedom of speech. So Ooh. if people want to uh, voice their interest in the public sphere and they are not completely free, they need to, for example, link their rhetoric to the rhetoric of power mm. and uh, not to be very direct, but uh, express their voices very indirectly. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Um, there, I, I think that that's a great point, right? That we, we tend to, in all of our, most of our PR scholarship be kind of grounded in free, democratic, relatively Western societies, right? And there, there's no way around it. Um, and our, our theories really should be doing more to address what PR looks like in different cultures. And we've seen some of that, right? We, we have, uh, you know, Katerina's work at looking at PR in Russia. Um, we have work in China and South Korea that looks at, you know, some of those transitions, but there's a lot more to do. Um, and I think that would be a great place to start, yeah. Uh, also about agony in the uh, activist activism context. I, I have an example which uh, also explains the senses, uh, maybe as, as a reflection of dialogue. Um, I talked to an activist group. They were saying that they, um, they, um, they were working around uh, the LGBTQ issue. They were one of the very active groups uh, in, in, in Mardi Gras. And they were saying that we, as an activist group, we don't um, build relationship with the police because if we build this relationship, we uh, have been excluded the, ind the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So they were excluding the police, but they were including the indigenous community as a specific activist group. So can we say that they have dialogue with both groups? With, with the indigenous community in, in, in the form of consensus and, and with the police in the form of dissensus. Sure. Um, I, I love the, I think it's from one of the contingency theory pieces, uh, the, t the term that they use, repugnant publics. Um, so they say that, you know, there are certain groups that an organization rationally for them would never want to have genuine dialogue with. Right, that would never take on or embrace the kind of risk or mutuality right, with a group that, that completely disagrees with them. Um, Ashley Stokes has a piece uh, looking at tobacco activists and tobacco companies. And guess what? They're never going to have any kind of consensus because they're literally trying to do opposite things. Um, but of course, that same organization could have genuine dialogue with a lot of other groups in society. It's just that one that they're diametrically opposed to, right? And so we always have to think about this as you know, one potential approach, but there are certainly a lot of other parts of that sort of constellation of what organizations can do, um, even if we, we know that this is an important one. Yes, and in the public relations scholarship, building strong relationships are always um, considered as a positive practice, while in practice we see that uh, in, in some spaces, building this strong relationship is uh, a negative thing. For example, some activists are being criticized for being corporatized, for building relationship with cor uh, corporations, while they need to advocate for their publics, like their mar the marginalized groups. Absolutely. And uh, sometimes a, an activist group it, it makes a lot of logical sense for them to sort of attack um, a, a specific corporation, to not build a relationship with them, maybe to worsen a relationship with them because it motivates their supporters, right? Because it generates a lot of good things for them in another area. Um, and again, it's, it's tough for us if, if we're only measuring relationship strength as our most important outcome to see any value in that. 
Um, and so I think that having uh, network approaches help us to better understand that. Um, these dialogue focused approaches and both looking at consensus and dissensus as reasonable outcomes all help us to better conceptualize the sort of complex ecology that a lot of practitioners find themselves in with their organizations. A hell of a lot more time than a top paper at ICA, huh? Seven minutes this year. Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. So for those of you who don't know, Luke has a top paper at ICA this week. So if any of you yeah. are logged into ICA, uh, go watch his presentation. And I think you also had a top paper at NCA, right? I did. I did. It was a good year. Good year. I Again, I, I don't have kids, you know, I, <laughs> I've been able to work this whole year. I know a lot of people are in, have, have a lot tougher, uh, you know, 2020s than I did. So um, also Shima has a great paper that I got to watch earlier today at ICA. So lots of good stuff happening there. I haven't been yes. in all the rooms yet, but. Thank you very much for commenting on it. Of course. Okay. All right. I'm going to head off. Good night, every, well, good day. Good night for me. <laughs> Luke, uh, this is one of the best I've seen, maybe because the topic I care about, but I've cared about all the topics so far, but uh, efficient, good slides, nice slide deck, uh, interactive. Uh, this is, who's ever watching this, this is the standard for the next one, those who are coming next time. Thank you so much, Maureen. Always great to see you, and thank you so much for your contributions as well. All right, so um, we'll wrap it up because it's getting late. It was nice of him to stay up late there in the foreign land that he lives in the United States or whatever it is. We appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to hit stop the recording. If there's any like secret questions you want to ask, now's the time. And then otherwise we'll wrap this up.